Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 103 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. Today we have an encore episode. It was originally episode 83 with Joanne Harpel. It ran last September in recognition of Suicide Awareness and Prevention Month. So I wanted to run it again this September for the same reason. Such an important topic. We had a terrific discussion and I hope you will listen and share it with somebody else who might benefit from it. Support for this podcast comes from BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online, anytime, anywhere. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Widowed Parent to learn more and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Widowed Parent. I hope you'll check it out. I had such a great discussion with Joanne Harpel for this episode, and we talk about a really difficult topic today. We're talking about coping after losing a loved one to suicide. And, you know, well, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, uh, many people seem to be uncomfortable with talking about death in general, and I think that uh, many people are even more uncomfortable talking about the topic of suicide. And it's a topic that we haven't really covered in depth on the show yet. It has come up in the context of some of my other discussions, interviewing some experts. Um, but I haven't done a whole episode on this topic yet. And since right now it is Suicide Prevention Month in September, as I record this, uh, I thought it would be a good time to do a discussion specifically on this. So I'm so grateful that Joanne was willing to come on the show and speak with us about it. She's actually an internationally renowned expert on this topic, and she really has a lot of good information to share with us. And I should add that while the focus is on suicide loss, I encourage you to listen even if you, your family has a different type of loss, because we also talk about uh, the topic of suicide in general, including how to um, help someone if, if you have a loved one who you're concerned about, um, ways to get some help uh, for them and ways to bridge the discussion. So I hope you enjoy my discussion with Joanne Harpel. My guest today is Joanne Harpel. Joanne is the president of Coping After Suicide and founder of the nonprofit Rethink the Conversation and is an international authority on suicide bereavement and postvention response. She is the recipient of the Survivor of the Year Award from the American Association of Suicidology and is the former longtime senior director for public affairs and postvention for the world's largest nonprofit dedicated to this issue, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, where she created the most well-respected, far-reaching array of programs and resources in the field. Joanne is also a seasoned guest lecturer, including at the United Nations and on Capitol Hill and for the American Psychiatric Association and many, many more. She's trained the chaplains of the U.S. Army and the psychologists of the South Korean National Police Agency, and has collaborated with hundreds of organizations, including the National Institute of Mental Health, the World Health Organization, and Sesame Street. So uh, Joanne is joining us today from New York City. Joanne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jenny. Yeah, well, I've really been looking forward to talking with you today. Um, You know, suicide loss is a a topic that I haven't specifically covered on the podcast yet, and it's it's come up a bit in the context of other kind of broader discussions with some grief experts. Um, but I've had requests from suicide loss survivors to do an episode specifically on this. Um, so let's let's just jump right in here. Um, can you tell us first how how you got involved in this line of work? Sure. So I started out my career as a lawyer. I was a corporate lawyer at a large corporate firm in New York City. And I lost my younger brother, Stephen, to suicide. Stephen was 26 years old. He had had no prior history of any kind of mental health issues at all until he very suddenly developed bipolar disorder when he was 26. And he went from being the valedictorian of his high school class, an honors graduate of Yale, went on to Harvard Law School, and then he went from that to not being able to make his bed in the morning. And we tried everything we could to get him the right help. 
but we ran out of time. And from the time he was first diagnosed until the time he took his own life was less than a year. Wow. And at the time he died, I didn't know anybody else at all who had lost someone to suicide. I didn't know anything about suicide. This was in the mid 90s. There was no internet. So I went to Barnes and Noble and I found the shelf that they had labeled death, if you can imagine. And I, so I went to the death shelf of Barnes and Noble and I bought every single book that they had with the word suicide in the title. And I started reading and trying to understand, you know, the lawyer in me wanted to understand what suicide was all about. I, I really didn't know anything about it. Um, what I knew is that I was absolutely reeling and devastated. My family was having an extremely difficult time with it. And the other thing I realized is that I wanted to do something with my life other than be a lawyer, that, that this really shook me up emotionally, but it also really shook me up in terms of what I wanted to spend my time doing and, and what I wanted to devote my energy to. Mm. So in the back of every single one of those books, there would always be an index of resources and they all listed different organizations that focused on suicide and suicide prevention. And there happened to be one that was based in New York City, which is where I lived then and still do. And I cold called them and I said, hi, I'm a lawyer. I live here in the city. I lost my brother. I'd really like to get involved somehow. Can you use me? And ended up getting involved with what I then over time discovered was the largest suicide prevention organization in the world called the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and started out as a volunteer. And after some time, they asked me if I wanted to join the National Board of Directors, which I did. And after a few years on the national board, they invited me to move over from being on the board to coming to join the senior management team to create a new department for them focused on people who had lost someone to suicide. So I, I just kept taking the next step that presented itself in front of me and um, was with them all together for 15 years. And in 2013 left to create a private practice called Coping After Suicide. Mm -hmm. Wow. So thank you for sharing that. I love that um, your personal experience pointed to a big gap and a big need and then you've you've turned around and really done something with that that's helping so many people so many other families so many other people who are struggling or or feeling alone and whatnot um so thank you for for sharing that with us thanks i mean i i think i've really tried to create for other people what i wish had been available for me yeah you know now it's now we just had the 27th anniversary of when he died. So as of a month ago, he's now been gone longer than he was here. Wow. So there just was almost nothing available back yeah. in the 90s. And so I, I think I recognized that there was a need to create what I wish had been around for me and for my family. Yeah, terrific. Um, y y you mentioned your organization that you have now, Coping After Suicide, your private practice. Um, and your tagline, I think, is, I've been there and I'm here. Why is, why is that important? So there's a certain way in which grief is grief and loss is loss and death is death. And people who lose someone to suicide are grieving and experiencing a loss the same way that people who've lost loved ones to any cause of death are grieving. And also there are ways in which suicide loss is very specific and unique. And the fact that I've lived through this myself means something to the people who reach out to me to work with me to try to get through it themselves. The fact that I've lived it, the fact that I know what it feels like, the, the fact that I've had family members who grappled with all kinds of, of issues relating to losing someone to suicide, that, that seems to matter to people. The fact that I've been there, that I've lived it. And then the other part about it, of the tagline, I've been there and I'm here, I think that, that has really a two-part meaning. One is there is something very powerful about seeing someone else who's been through something hard and is still, and is still there and has mm. come through it and it looks 
normal and seems strong and seems like they're living a life that is meaningful and productive and they're standing upright. And it also, the, the other part of the meaning is you're not alone. You know, losing someone to suicide can leave you feeling a little bit like an alien and very alone and disconnected from the people around you because it's, it's something that people don't understand very well. It's very stigmatized. Thankfully, it's fairly rare. But what that means is when you've lost someone to suicide, it can be very hard to connect with other people who really get it. Mm. And so I'm here in the sense of you're not, you're not in this all by yourself. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I'm thinking, I mean, listeners here, some may have suicide losses and some have other types of losses, um, whether they're cancer or accidents or other illnesses. Or, um, But I'm just thinking, you know, probably most of us have found that people don't want to talk about death in general. Um, and I'm imagining that, you know, if people avoid talking about death, they like really avoid talking about death by suicide. That's exactly right. I mean, I met my now husband a year after my brother died. And I remember panicking about what I was going to say when he asked me, how many brothers and sisters do you have? And, uh. and then when I said to him, I, I had a brother who died, how was I going to answer it when he said, how did he die? Uh -huh. If he had died of cancer, I wouldn't have had to gear myself up and be all panicked about how I, how was I going to answer a question on a second date about how my brother died. But because it was suicide, I was worried about how this guy was going to react to it. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, there are, it's not that the loss of my brother is different from someone who lost their brother to cancer. I miss him the same way they miss him, but there's a whole social stigma component to suicide that is really difficult and really complicated. Well, let's talk about that since you just brought it up, I wonder if you have some tips for people who are thinking about, um, you know, how to answer the inevitable questions, whether they're from people close to you or people not close to you, you know, strangers or colleagues, acquaintances, friends. Um, I guess what kind of tips can you share with us maybe if somebody is dreading that question, oh, how did your person die? My first piece of advice is to trust your instinct, that often the way you answer the question depends a lot on what the situation is, whether you think this person is going to be meaningful in your life, whether it's at a cocktail party and it's a very social, superficial occasion, or whether it's a, a situation that lends itself to more personal vulnerable sharing. Sometimes it's just a function of how much sleep you had the night before and whether you have enough energy to go into it. Sometimes you're in the mood to talk about it. And I, you can find yourself in a conversation with someone you don't know very well, and you're suddenly giving them an earful of very personal information because you just have the need to talk about it. So that the first tip is you may answer the question differently each time. And it may take a little bit of trial and error to see how you feel. Um, often what I suggest to clients, if they're, if they're feeling uncertain about using the word suicide, if, you know, if I say I lost my brother and they say, oh, someone says, oh, what happened? How did he die? Sometimes they'll answer it. It, it was really tragic. He died really tragically. And mm. that tragic seems to be a good sort of all purpose way of describing it that most people will will then respect and not cross examine you and continue to pepper you with questions. But it also conveys this is a serious, sensitive, difficult subject for me and I'm not inclined to go into it right here at this cocktail party. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so let's back up then. Um, a, a, Cause you mentioned that, you know, in some ways suicide loss has much in common with other, you know, grief from other types of loss, but in some ways there are different issues or challenges or things that come up. And I wonder if you could share with us a little bit, um, maybe some of the ways suicide loss is different and some issues that kind of commonly come up in, in families. So the single biggest sort of defining aspect of suicide loss is that the, is the grappling with the question, why, why did this happen? Now that's not to say people who was loved ones to other causes of death don't also sometimes grapple with that question. But I've worked with thousands of survivors of suicide loss over 20 years. I haven't met a single one yet who wasn't grappling with that question of why did this happen? 
Mm. So for some people, that why question is a very literal, concrete one, where they're replaying the person's last hours or days over and over and over again, trying to, like an episode of CSI, looking for the clues and were there things that were said that maybe I missed or misinterpreted. So for some people, that why question is a very literal question. For other people, that why question is an existential question. Why, why does this happen? In some cases, people are grappling with it in terms of their faith and their spirituality. It, it is such a shocking experience, even if you had some awareness that the person you cared about was at risk for suicide. Suicide itself is almost always experienced as a shock and as something that people are trying to make sense out of, trying to come up with some kind of narrative that holds together that tells a coherent story so they can understand why it happened. That's a defining feature of the experience of losing someone to suicide. Another piece is very closely related to that, and it, it, it has to do with who is responsible. And often that includes wondering, did I have some role? Do I, am I somehow culpable? Am I somehow responsible? Am I somehow blameworthy? So most people who lose someone to suicide find themselves in this sort of round robin of whose fault was it? Was it my fault? Was it the doctor's fault? Was it the therapist's fault? Was it the boss who fired him? Was it the wife who left him? Was it God? Was it the therapist? And they try on all these different theories about who was responsible. So this, this intense driver to make sense out of suicide is a really unique feature of it that almost everyone I've ever worked with has been grappling with in one way or another. Mm, okay, very interesting. Um, and in terms of then what to expect kind of in the aftermath of a suicide and maybe what's normal or when to worry kind of about, about that, can you share some thoughts with us on that? Sure. So I think most of us have a belief, even if we're not aware of it, that if something really tragic happens in your family, it will bring everyone together. Mm. And sometimes that is what happens. That is not what happened in my family, and that's not what happens in many, many families. Often what can happen is that because suicide is so complicated that it can leave families very disconnected. And often there can be anger or blame between and among family members. Often family members are grieving very, very differently. So some of them want to talk about it all the time, want to cry, want to hug, want to be very close and connected. And others can't talk about it. It's too painful or it's just not how they are inclined to try to cope. And so the differences in the coping styles combined with the effort to make sense out of the suicide and and that combined with grappling with who was responsible with was I somehow responsible or was someone else somehow responsible that trifecta can can be really really complicated and can often interfere with everybody in the family being united and connected and and cohesive as they try to cope with it so one thing I try to do is normalize that that suicide can cause a lot of tension in, in the family. And I, I mean, I remember the first Mother's Day, my brother died in July. The first Mother's Day, that next May, which was less than a year, I ended up in a huge fight with my mother and found myself screaming at her, I hate you. Well, I didn't actually, I love my mother. I don't, I have a wonderful relationship with her, but I was so tangled up with so many intense emotions and trying so hard to understand what had happened in my life, but I didn't have the capacity to be patient and loving and supportive to someone else in my family who was dealing with it very differently than I was. Mm, gotcha. Um, well, this is making me think about communication within families and particularly for this audience. Um, most of my listeners are parents, widowed parents who have children or teenagers or college age, you know, students, not adult children, but younger children. Um, and I'm wondering if you can give us some tips or some thoughts on how those parents would talk with their own children um, about the death by suicide of someone, maybe their other parent has died of suicide or per perhaps a sibling or somebody close to them. Um, because I think that a lot of 
parents might think they should try to somehow protect well everyone wants to protect their kids the question is what does protect mean and sometimes i think people wonder if maybe they should not reveal the cause of death can you talk about that a little bit i'm a parent also and i my kids are 19 and 22 and so i get it i understand that that impulse that we have to protect our children and Suicide is, is a topic that is so fraught in our culture and so frightening that it is absolutely understandable for parents to feel an impulse not to talk about it directly. The challenge is that, first of all, it's, it's a really, really hard secret to keep. And if your child is going to find out that their parent or their sibling took their own life, wouldn't you rather that they find out about it from you? Ah. Not through the gossip mill, not by reading something on social media, not by overhearing a conversation. If there is a difficult, painful subject to talk about, children need to feel that they're hearing about it from someone that they trust, someone who loves them, someone who will answer their questions in a respectful, age-appropriate way. And so I strongly encourage parents to tell the truth about it. I have been in many situations where I've actually role-played with a parent exactly how to tell even a very young child about suicide. You want to do it in, an, in a way that is age-appropriate. There's absolutely no need for graphic or gory details. But there, is, there are absolutely ways to explain it, even to young children, that overall conveys that you are there for them, that you will answer their questions, and that they don't also have to worry that there's some secret that, that they're not being told. Children sense when there's something going on and, and they're not being told the truth. So, for example, my, my children never knew my brother. He died before they were born. And um, when my son was three, he's now 19, but when he was three, he said to me, how did Uncle Stephen die? Mm. I hadn't necessarily been planning to talk to my three-year-old about suicide, but because I do this work for a living, I, had, I was prepared to. I just, it caught me up short. I wasn't really expecting him to ask that question at such a young age. And so what I said to him was, well, Uncle Stephen had an illness in his brain and the illness made him make some very bad choices. And one of the choices that he made was he stopped taking the medicine that the doctor told him that he had to take in order to get better. And so he didn't get better. He, his brain got more and more and more sick. And your brain isn't like your elbow or your fingernail. If your brain is really sick, your whole body can't work well. And his brain got more and more sick and he finally died because he killed himself. Now, it may sound shocking to some of your listeners, the idea that I would explain suicide in a direct way to a three-year-old. But I fast forward to picking him up at school in first grade and his teacher met me at the door of the classroom looking very pale and <laughs> shaky. And I said, um, what, what's going on? And she said, well, the kids had to write a story today about a family member and your son wrote about his uncle. My son was sick. And I, I read the essay and my six-year-old, of course, you know, with all of this spelling, the way six-year-olds spell, so everything is spelled wrong and the E has, you know, 25 horizontal lines in it. And he said in, his, in this little essay that he wrote at the age of six, my uncle Stephen had an illness in his brain the illness made him make bad choices. He made a bad choice to kill himself. The teacher was completely freaked out. My mm. six-year-old was fine. Mm. And it, it, it was such a powerful reminder that what, the, what kids care about is they're getting honest information from sources that they trust. Mm. They can handle the content much better than they can handle that big sense that they're being lied to. Mm -hmm. So I think a couple of the points that I'm hearing in this are, first of all, it's super important to be honest with them. Secondly, 
it doesn't matter how old they are. There's a way to have the conversation. And if you don't be tempted to think, oh, my kid is only two or three or six, I will wait until they are X age. And then I will sit them down and tell them that it's better to maybe just start that conversation organically as it comes up. I certainly respect that parenting is very complicated and we, all of us as parents make individual choices and judgment calls. So I, I, I want to be gentle about this and not prescriptive, mm. but it has been my experience overwhelmingly that kids can handle straightforward information much better than we fear they can. And especially since it is extremely likely that they are going to either hear about it from some other source or sense that they're being told it was a heart attack or told it was a car accident, but it doesn't quite line up with the things that they're overhearing when you're on the phone or the, the energy in the room, that there are ways to talk in a straightforward, honest manner that it will not increase the child's risk that they will somehow someday take their own life just because you've talked to them about it. Ah, well, that's an interesting point, um, it, which makes me think about so I guess shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, sometimes if some, maybe somebody's worried about their kid or their teenager. So I guess this is a little different on the, the question of increasing someone's risk of suicide. But, you know, if somebody is worried about their kid or their teenager and wondering if suicide might be on their mind or a risk or something, is it okay to ask them? Does that make them more likely to do it? Or how does all that work? So, it is absolutely safe to ask someone a direct question about whether they may be suicidal. What the research shows is that it does not increase their risk. It does not somehow put the idea in their mind. It does not have somehow make it more likely if they are suicidal that they will act on, on the, those suicidal feelings. It is absolutely safe and preferable to ask a direct question. The way to ask it is to say in a loving setting, I'm concerned about your safety. Are you thinking about hurting yourself or killing yourself? Okay. You don't want to preface it with all kinds of defensive language about um, I'm, I'm, I hate to ask this or I'm really sorry to bring this up. You just want to say in a very loving way, I'm concerned about your safety. You've said some things, you've done some things that I'm noticing that, are, that, that lead me to be concerned about your safety. And so I'm, I, I want to ask you, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? That is a safe thing to do, whether that person has been exposed to suicide because they've lost a parent or a sibling or someone they love, or if you're just concerned about them because there's somebody in your life and you are, you're worried about them. Mm. It is absolutely safe to ask. And, and this is kind of regardless of the age. I mean, teenager. Okay. But a 10 year old, a six year old, is this still okay? It, it is okay. Thankfully, suicide is extremely, extremely rare in young people. The, the, the suicide risk in terms of who is most likely to kill themselves, overwhelmingly middle-aged and older men are at the highest risk for suicide. To, re to see what's covered in the media, you would think it skews much younger. But middle-aged and older men are, are at the highest risk. Suicide does occur, certainly does occur in teenagers and even occasionally does occur in, in younger children. It is extremely, extremely rare. But it is, if you, if you, if your gut instinct is telling you that you have reason to be concerned, eight-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, if they are suicidal, they are suicidal whether you ask them or not. Mm. So asking them is the only option you have to try to get some information that could help you help them. Okay. Okay. I think that's because it is scary. The thought of, you know, coming at this as a person who doesn't know anything about this to think exactly what you said. If I ask them, will that put the idea in their head? 
it, it, there is very consistent research over a long period of time that it does not put the idea in someone's head and does not increase risk. In fact, it's the opposite that the research shows that it is, it is far preferable if you are genuinely concerned about someone to ask the question directly. Okay. Okay. Um, and then depending on what they say, I guess, if they give an answer that is concerning, what should someone do then? So, you know, as lay people, I'm, I'm a lay person, I'm not a clinician. As lay people, it can be difficult sometimes to know what their answer means. Okay. Even sometimes clinicians find it difficult. So, you know, there are people who say something like, if I never woke up tomorrow, it would be fine with me. Mm. It's hard to know. So if, if, if someone you love has said something like that, and you say to them, the fact that you said that concerns me. Are you actually thinking about killing yourself? And they say, no, I'm, no, I'm just, it's just a, you know, passing comment. How do you assess that? You only mm. have one data point. It's, you know, it's hard to really know where that fits and, and how worried you need to be. So, um, so there is a certain amount of, of judgment. If a person says, no, I'm not suicidal, um, sometimes you need to ask them a couple of other questions to to sort of flesh it out a little bit. Okay, well, you're telling me you're not suicidal, so tell me more about what you meant when you said, if I never woke up tomorrow, it would be fine with me. Then you actually have to listen to the answer that they're giving, right? But let's say they say, yes, I am. I am thinking about killing myself. Your question to me is, what do you do then? So the first thing is not to panic, that you are, want to think of yourself as a link in the chain. You are not single-handedly responsible for saving this person, but nor can you be irresponsible and ignore it if someone that you, cares, that you care about says that. So what you want to do is connect them with someone who is much better equipped than you are to see how serious the risk may be and what kind of help may be appropriate. So there are a few ways to do that. You can say to the person, I, the fact, thank you for telling me that that's how you feel. I know that is probably a really difficult thing to, to acknowledge. I care a lot about you. I'm, I'm right here with you. We're going we're gonna to see about getting you some help so that you don't continue to suffer because it must be awful to feel that way. You're going to be compassionate and you're going to be empathetic and you have a few options. You could encourage them to call their doctor you could encourage them to call their therapist if they have one. You could bring in other family members. You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline either with them or for them. Um, you, if you call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, you will be connected to a trained crisis worker who can help you and or the person brainstorm what appropriate next steps might be and refer them to help and other resources that are close by. So the phone number is 800-273-TALK, which is 800-273-8255. If you really are concerned that they are at imminent risk right then and there, it also may be appropriate to accompany them to the emergency room or to call 911. Hmm. And when you go to the emergency room, what are you asking for? We're saying you're asking you're you're saying that, that you know this this is my friend Jenny and she she's been saying some things that have had me concerned that she might be suicidal and we've been talking about it and she told me that she is feeling suicidal and I want to make sure that she's in really good hands and is taken care of because I love her and I care about her and and this is scary mm. and then they'll do some kind of like a suicide risk assessment exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. So, okay. so the, the, the really the message is that we as lay people can't diagnose someone and, and sometimes it's hard to know exactly how to interpret what we're being told. You want to take it seriously and you want to treat them with, with compassion and with love and with care because you care about them. Hmm. And, if, and if you're a parent and this is your teenager or your child, you could take them into the hospital or the local children's hospital as well. <laughs> Yes, you absolutely could. It's it's always a bit of a balance because the more you um, the more you take a big step, 
the system sort of gets uh, operationalized. And so if you said to your teenager, are you thinking about killing this, yourself? And they said, actually, I am. You don't necessarily want to just stick them in the car and drive them to the emergency room. You want to have a conversation where you're really engaging them with trying to understand what's going on for them and 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 what do you, what do you think would be helpful? Do you want to call your um, should we call your pediatrician and talk it through with them if they have a therapist? You know, you you don't want to you don't want to escalate things so quickly that the person feels overwhelmed. You want to mm-hmm. treat them respectfully and with as much agency as you possibly can because you're coming from a place of loving them, not wanting to control them. Okay. Okay. Um, and as far as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, so it sounds like it's okay then to call as, I mean, I think I imagine a phone number like that as, you know, a person who is suicidal, who's in the throes of an emergency of some sort calling. But it sounds like you're saying no, that you could, as a, a parent or a friend, you could call and ask for advice about someone you're concerned about. Um, you could call in kind of a non-urgent situation for some, for some really important advice. Absolutely. I, I'm, on a, I'm on a national advisory committee for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And one of the things that we talk a lot about are all the different ways that the lifeline can be a resource. So certainly for someone who themselves is at risk, they can c- call the lifeline and get help. No, no question about it. And as you described, that's the sort of typical way you imagine a, life, a, a hotline working. But it is a wonderful and very important resource for family, for friends, for clergy, for funeral directors, for anyone who is potentially in a situation where they're concerned about someone to call because when the person on the other end who's going to answer the phone can help you think through and brainstorm and strategize and figure out what is it that we're dealing with here and what's the best kind of help to try to access. So they Mm -hmm. are a resource. They're not just the last resort when someone is acutely and imminently suicidal. Uh, Okay. Well, thank you. I think that's important to to know. And then there's a text, a way to access this by text as well, right? There is. So there's a different, it's a different entity. It's called the crisis text line. And the crisis text line, what's particularly um, good to know about that is many people, particularly young people, are much less inclined to pick up the phone and make a phone call Mm. than they are to send a text. So what you can do to access the crisis text line is you can text pretty much any word. I, I typically suggest people text the word talk because it's easy to remember, but you could text the word help. You could text pretty much any word, but you're going to text it to the number 741741. And when you text to that number, you will automatically get a response from a live person who's texting you right back. And so the crisis text line, although it certainly is a wonderful resource around suicide risk and suicidality is also a crisis helpline for any other issue. So they're getting lots and lots of texts now from people who are experiencing anxiety around COVID. They're dealing, they they can respond to texts relating to domestic violence or to drug and alcohol use, bullying. So it's it's a much broader resource than just about suicide prevention, whereas the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is specific to suicide risk. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, Well, so speaking of resources, I think that you have just started or just in the process of starting the first ever Zoom-based group for teenagers. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. We have our first meeting in an hour, actually. Ah, Uh Uh, So for years, I have been running uh, suicide bereavement support groups. And up until... COVID, these groups met in my living room um, Mm. and um, were in-person groups. And when we, along with the entire rest of the world, had to shift everything to Zoom, um, I created several new support groups because I now had the ability to reach survivors of suicide loss across the country and in, in many cases now internationally. And so in addition to the, to the, suicide bereavement support groups that I was already running, I've added several new groups. So one of those groups is specifically for mothers who've lost a child to suicide. 
Another is a group specifically for um, many of your listeners may be interested. It's a group specifically for those who've lost a spouse, partner, or significant other to suicide. Mm. And then the newest one, which is starting today, is specifically for teens who've lost someone to suicide. So this is a group of teens, some of whom have lost a parent, some of whom have lost a sibling that come from all over the country. And it's the first time that there is a support group specifically for teenagers who've lost someone to suicide. So um, as I was talking with each of these teenagers to, as, as they expressed interest in possibly joining the group, I asked each one of them, do you, do you know anyone among your friends who's lost anybody to suicide and, and to a to a one they said no they didn't know anybody else other than their own family members they didn't know anyone else and so teens want to fit in right they want they want to feel normal they want to feel like like any other teenager and when, when they lose someone to suicide they don't they don't know anyone else their age has been through it and they don't know how to find anybody else their age has been through it and so this is a national zoom based support group just for teenagers who've lost a parent or a sibling to suicide. That's terrific. I, you know, I, I often hear that kids and teenagers who have lost a parent to any cause of death feel alone and like they don't know any other kids who have lost a parent or they don't, other kids maybe don't get what they're going through. And so I can imagine, you know, isolating that even further to this specific, highly stigmatized t cause of death would make them feel even more isolated. That's right. I mean, we, I've heard about kids who said, you know, I was 13 when my mom died and I'm 22 now and I still haven't met anybody else who wow. lost a parent to suicide. It, it, it's just a very difficult thing for teenagers to connect with. And so the hope is that this will create a forum for teenagers to finally feel like there are other people out there just like them. Yeah. My oh, brother terrific. and sister... Yeah, I mean, my brother and sister were both teenagers. When my brother died, my brother was 15 and my sister was 19. And so I always think back to, to what their experience was like. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll put a link in the show notes for sure. I know you said that the first group is starting today. Um, by the time this airs, if people still want to get involved, will there be like a second iteration of this or is it an ongoing group? Yeah, all of the groups that I run meet in cycles think sort of like a trimester so they meet continuously there are always new groups that start every few months throughout the year so no matter when someone hears about this um they can always get in touch with me and and i can give them information about when the next group is starting these groups that are now on zoom will stay on zoom even after we're all back allowed back out of our houses and there's no more quarantine these zoom groups have proven to be so powerful because people can connect from all over the country. And so th they will be ongoing. Yeah. If somebody isn't in New York City, they'll still be able to access your, your groups. We've had people participate from California, from Tennessee, and from Turkey, and from Norway. And um, it's been really quite unbelievable. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. And so then just rounding out the resources discussion, I guess, in terms of other resources on your website that people should know about and or resources from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention on their website. Are there maybe a couple of things to maybe highlight for listeners that I can put links in the show notes to check out? Absolutely. So my website is copingaftersuicide.com and that, that will give information about the groups I run and also I, I work with individuals and with couples and with families in the aftermath of suicide. And then depending on what kinds of things people are interested in, there are, there are several different places they can go. So the website of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has, for example, a directory of support groups all around the country. They also run a program that I, that I started when I was there um, that we used to call the outreach program that they now call the Healing Conversations Program. And that can put survivors of suicide loss in contact with other survivors of suicide loss who've been trained to do to to make personal visits those visits are now over the phone or by video chat um well, they will someday again be in person but but it can be really powerful if you if you've lost your spouse to suicide and you want to just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone else who lost their spouse who's a few years ahead of you that healing conversation program is is available mm. there also is a bibliography and and other resources um so it depends on what someone is interested in. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Terrific. And speaking of bibliography, is there like a particular go-to book on this topic that, uh, that you could suggest? Or is it more like people need to look over a whole list and pick the one that's in their, I don't know, interest or situation? My, my favorite go-to book that I recommend is, um, is by an author by the name of Jack Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N. Um, and you can get it on, on Amazon. It's not, it's not esoteric. It's called After Suicide Loss, Coping with Your Grief. Um, there are many books out there. I, I particularly like this one. It's, it's written by um, Jack Jordan, who's a psychologist who um, is retired now, but spent most of his career working directly with survivors of suicide loss. And he has a co-author, Bob Bauer, and they wrote it together. And it, what I like about it is that it's written for people in the first year of their grief. So it really takes into account that when you're newly grieving, it's hard to take in a lot of information. So it's written in a very clear way that's very practical. Um, and he has a, a lot of experience. So he really understands what, what, it, what that's like. Um, another book that I recommend a lot, you asked before about um, explaining the suicide of a parent to, to children. So there's a book that I like very much called After a Parent's Suicide um, that is written by a woman named Margot, and I'm going to spell her name. It's R-E-Q-U-A-R-T-H, Margot Reckworth. And the reason I like her book and, and recommend it is that she lost her own mother to suicide when she was four. And she then went on to become a children's bereavement counselor. And so she wrote a book about what it's, the book is aimed at the parents, aimed at the adults, on how to help children and teenagers deal with the suicide of a parent. But she writes it from the point of view of having lived it herself and also been a children's bereavement counselor. Ah, terrific. Oh, good. I'll put both of those in the show notes then. I think those sound like some really great resources. The other thing I think I'm going to put in the show notes, I read... A really interesting article that I think I found somewhere on your website. It was, I think you co-wrote this in the Association for Death Education and Counseling quarterly publication back in 2014. It's called Grief After Suicide, the Impact on Families. Yeah. I thought there were some really interesting, um, important kind of call out points in there about, um, you know, how it might shut down communication in the, within the family and foster secrets and, um, how secrets can uh, create shame and emotional shutting down. And just, I thought a re lot of really good stuff for people to, um, to understand. Thank you. Yeah. Suicide loss is really complicated and you can find yourself feeling lots of conflicting things all at the same time. And it can be really reassuring. It's not necessarily that it makes it, easier to deal with but it can be really reassuring to know that what you're going through is really normal mm. it's re and um and so the the more that you're hearing that message that suicide loss is complicated and messy and brings up a lot of of conflicting feelings and that's really normal it can help you it can help you get the ground centered under your feet again yeah yeah okay good um and one last thing, I guess, if I'm thinking about, you know, if somebody's interested in, in like you did, in saying, I want to get involved, I want to help. I think we've got Suicide Prevention Month coming up in September, and we have, we have a, um, there's a day in November as well. Uh, what's it called? Yeah, so the day in November is International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day, um, which originally was created by Senator Harry Reid of Nevada, who lost his father to suicide. So there was a a resolution in the U.S. Senate declaring the Saturday before Thanksgiving to be a day dedicated to survivors of suicide loss. And so what happens on that day is that there are events for survivors of suicide loss. The last, when I left AFSP, we were, at that point, the, the program was taking place in 300 cities on six continents. Wow. Um, now, and online. This year, I, I'm certain it will be all be online. But, um, but to so the Saturday before Thanksgiving, and, and there's information about that. The website is survivorday.org. Okay. In terms of getting involved, it, it's always a little bit, it, 
I, I always stumble a little bit when I'm asked this question, and, and here's the reason. On one hand, who is going to be the champion for suicide prevention if not those of us who've been touched by this issue personally, right? We're the ones who, who are most likely to take up the cause and be the advocates and lead the effort to, to, um, to reduce the stigma because we've been impacted so powerfully. We're not the only ones, but certainly there's a, a strong driver in us, in many of us, to do that. And I would never want to discourage or dissuade someone from getting involved in the work of suicide prevention if they feel a strong desire to do it. I also usually encourage people to give themselves the gift of some time for their own healing before they become champions for a cause. Mm. Because what can happen is that people who are grieving sometimes feel, if I can just get active and keep this from happening to anyone else, maybe this won't hurt so much. And some people jump right into the action and the activism first. And I wish it worked that way. I wish you could just be active enough that the pain wouldn't hurt. But what, what can happen is if you become really involved in the cause very, very quickly, it can create burnout because it's very hard to sustain that level of activism when you're also grieving. And then what sometimes can happen is that people get very hard on themselves. They beat up on themselves that, that they're somehow letting their loved ones down because they're not able to sustain the activism. And so I would never discourage someone from becoming active, but I, but I really encourage people, those first couple of years are hard. And um, to, to give yourself the gift of, of being supported and taking, taking your time to really think about how you want to get involved and what you want to do, there is, there is time enough. So, for example, we had a big... Um, fundraising campaign on the 10th anniversary of when my brother died to raise money for suicide prevention research. So we reached out to family and friends and every high school classmate of my brothers and every college classmate of my brothers and every family friend and every cousin I hadn't spoken to in forever. Um, and I had the energy for that at that point. It would have been, that would have been an exhausting thing to do six months after he died. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, I think, well, gosh, I think we keep talking about this, but I do think we're reaching the end of our time today. Um, so let me just ask one last question, if you don't mind. Um, if you could say one thing to survivors of suicide loss, what would you say to them? First of all, I would say, I'm so sorry. Um, then I would say to them, tell me about your loved one. Because people who've lost someone to suicide often fear two different things. Sometimes they fear both of them. They fear that their loved one's going to be forgotten completely. Or they fear that their loved one is going to be remembered only by the way they died and the day they died. Mm. And so I think what I would say to them is that the person that you lost was a human being a three-dimensional, 360-degree human being with wonderful qualities and qualities that you couldn't stand and favorite foods and annoying habits and, um, and that they were a person who, who lived and who you loved. And I would, um, I would want to hear about who that person was to them. And so what I would encourage your listeners to do um, is to remember that the person they loved was a whole human being and isn't just defined by the way that they died. Terrific. Well, I think, I think that's a great place for us to end today. Um, so my guest today is Joanne Harpel, who is the president of Coping After Suicide and is an international authority on suicide bereavement and post vention response. So Joanne, where can listeners find you if they'd like to learn more about your work? The easiest place is my website, which is copingaftersuicide.com. 
um, all the information about everything that I do, my work with individual clients, my work with families, all of the national Zoom-based groups that I run, all of my work is at copingaftersuicide.com. Super. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes for sure. And uh, can you share with us one more time the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Crisis Text Line? So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the phone number is one 800 273 talk which is 800-273-8255. And the crisis text line, you can text pretty much any word to start the text chat. The easiest word to remember for me is the word talk, and you're going to text it to 741-741. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Joanne, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Joanne Harpel as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 83. And a great big shout out today to all of my listeners in Australia and New Zealand. It's so great to have you guys here. And I would love to know more about the resources available in your locations. Uh, So if you are listening and you are there and you know about a uh, grief program or grief center, some kinds of resources that I should know about, shoot me an email, jenny at jennylisk.com. I'm actually working on a uh, some live streams for Children's Grief Awareness Month, and I would like to talk to lots and lots of centers and programs in uh, all different locations. And actually, if you know about centers or programs uh, wherever you're located in the world or also all around the United States, um, reach out and let me know. I'd love to talk to them uh, in November. Okay. Hey, as always, thank you for listening. And until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.